after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, the Bible says he appeared in person to his disciples and to 500 of his followers. But Jesus didn't appear to Pilate, have you ever wondered why? Or to Herod, or to the chief priest, or those that engineered his crucifixion. He didn't appeal to them, why? appear to them, why? Because it was not the time. They're, they're going to see him on that day that is yet future. Revelation 1, 7 says, look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Even the people that pierced him, even the people that engineered his death are going to see him and they're going to be in a state of shock. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. In Acts 1, 11, it says this same Jesus, which shall, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And they were watching to see him go into heaven, his ascension, and it says he disappeared into a cloud. I think it was a cloud of angels come to escort him back to heaven because there were angels that came when he was born. They escorted him to earth, and now he's going back to heaven after his resurrection, and they've come to escort him back. You know, before a great work of art, such as a statue or a painting is presented to the public, it's usually kept hidden. People may know what the work, that the work's being prepared. They may even know the location, but they've not seen it. And when the day of the presentation arrives, the artwork is covered by a cloth until the moment of unveiling. People come with great anticipation and the event is often preceded by a ceremony. And when the covering is removed, the work of art stands unveiled, open for all to see. That day, the scripture says, it'll be the unveiling of one who's been hidden. Today is the day in which Christ is hidden. He's not here in person in the sense of his flesh. He's not seen. Whom having not seen ye love, said Peter in 1 Peter 1.8. But in that day, he's going to be revealed. You see, this is a day of faith. We come to him by faith, but then it's going to be sight. We're going to see him person to person. And I'm looking forward to that day when I see Jesus Christ person to person and to be able to fall at his feet and thank him for dying on the cross for me so that I can have my sins forgiven and I can go to heaven and spend eternity with him. You know, in Eastern countries, a man is presented to, in many Eastern countries, a man is presented on his wedding day with his bride. The first time he's ever seen the bride is on his wedding day. She's hidden under a veil. And I can imagine the anticipation of those young men waiting to see what kind of a woman their parents picked out for them to see his bride for the first time. We love Christ, but we've not seen him. He's hidden beyond the veil. We long to see him in person. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, the scripture says, we will see him with his mighty angels. What a day that's going to be when he comes like lightning from heaven, like a crack of thunder. And then secondly, it'll be a day of condemnation. To believers, it's going to be a time of ecstasy and joy and excitement and glory. But to those who do not know him, it's going to be a day of judgment. God has placed within us a strong desire to see justice done in the world. We cheer when the good guys win and the bad guys lose on television. We applaud the legal system when it brings to justice a person who has brought great harm to others. We applaud the legal system when it does something to bring about social justice in our communities. Yet many people refuse to believe that God will one day bring justice to this earth, but he's going to do it. And it's going to be on his terms to every one of us. We're going to have to face the judgment. God is perfect in love and justice. God is a God of love. Don't leave here and let people think that God is not a God of love. The thing that I want you to remember most out of this whole crusade is that God loves you. No matter who you are, what you are, what your ethnic background is, how many sins you've committed, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. God is going to keep on loving you to the very grave. He loves you. He is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice and he's going to bring people throughout the world to a place of judgment and bring justice to the world. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 
The eighth and ninth verse, it says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting banishment from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Think of that. The Revised Standard Version translates this verse as exclusion from the presence of God. You see, what it really means is that we're going, those of you that are lost, those of you that don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may be a member of the church and all that, but deep inside you're not sure how you stand before God and you may be lost. To all of you, you're going to catch a glimpse of Christ in His glory. You're going to see all the glory and all the thrill and the joy of heaven for one moment and you'll carry that memory throughout eternity but you won't be able to enjoy it. You're going to be excluded from his presence, the scripture says. I remember when I heard about that for the first time from a Greek scholar at Cambridge University. I remember the impact that made upon me when he said that that's what that passage means. And I began to think about catching a glimpse of Jesus in all of his glory and all of his power and I was to be a part of it in heaven and I missed it because of my own lust or my own greed or my own pride or my own ego or because I wouldn't surrender to Christ on the cross. It also is going to be a day of salvation, a day of salvation. That's where we come to glorification. You've heard of salvation and sanctification. That is called glorification. Who are the objects of salvation? What's the nature of salvation? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, rest. This indicates that many inequalities are going to be ironed out. There'll be perfect justice. The poor of the world will have their needs met and many of the rich will become poor. You remember the rich man and the poor man Jesus told about? And the poor man died and went to heaven to be with Jesus. And the rich man who had no time for the poor died and he went to hell and there was a great gulf between them and the rich man cried out. He saw Abraham. He cried out and said, come and just bring one little bit of water. Just touch my tongue with water and please go tell my brothers not to come to this place. It's terrible. Whatever hell is, it's separation from God. Heaven is described in terms that indicate the important thing though is not going to be our joy. Oh, I'm going to jump up and down if they'll let me. I'm going to applaud more than the people of Albany. I'm going to applaud the Lord Jesus Christ until my hands fall off. I'm going to kneel until my knees will be filled with blood from kneeling and giving him the glory and the praise and honor. But that's not going to be the big thing. The big thing is that Jesus is going to be so revealed in beauty and glory in and through us, his saints, that the whole universe is going to stand and marvel that Christ could do such a thing by his death and his resurrection, that he could take sinners like you and me who are opposed to God, who break his laws, who disobey him every day, and he's going to take us and make us into what he plans for the future. And we're going to share with him in reigning and ruling. He's going to be so revealed in beauty and glory in and through his saints that the whole universe will stand in amazement. You see, a craftsman is revealed by his work. Sir Christopher Lynn, Wren was the designer of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And I remember when we first went to London the year after the war, Cliff Barras and his wife Billy and my wife and I went to England and we preached there for six months and the whole city was almost in ruins. But you could see St. Paul's Cathedral standing in all of its glory. It had suffered a little damage, but not much. And Sir Christopher Wren had designed it. And inside the cathedral, there's a plaque to his memory. And it says, if you seek the monument of Sir Christopher Wren, look about you. This is his monument. The monument of our Lord Jesus Christ work on earth at the cross and the resurrection is going to be you and me. All of those that know Christ, the body of Christ, 
we are his workmanship. When the universe looks upon his glorified church, they will marvel at his beauty. They're not going to think of you and me, they're going to think of him. All of our thoughts are going to be centered in him. The universe will be impressed not by us, but by him who could accomplish all this. Christ will be the center of heaven. And in hell, wherever you look, you'll never see him. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.